there are occasions when I think people approach communication as though it's an equation to be solved. Like if they can just figure out this one thing, this one trick to do it, then they'll have everything figured out about communication. They're just really trying to crack the code. What is it that they need to do? Just one thing they need to, to change. And uh, the truth is, you know, I don't care if you if you bring in will hunting, um, you're not going to get that equation because it's not really an equation. There is no equation to be solved uh, to, for effective communication. Um, you know, an equation oftentimes, you know, even the simplest one, if we look at one plus one equals two, pretty straightforward, right? We understand that. We see that we, even I know what that means and, and that it adds up to two. But the truth is in communication, it's not one plus one equals two. It's one plus dump truck equals giraffe, which, you know, obviously makes no sense. But there's so many different variables in communication that you can't just look at it as though it's a straightforward communi a, a straightforward equation like that. It just doesn't operate like that. It's just different. And so as a result, there's no really a right way or wrong way to communicate necessarily. One right way or one wrong way to communicate. So we approach communication, all types of communication, all elements of communication with the attitude of progress, not perfection. Right. It's a, it's a matter of progress. We're constantly learning and uh, and changing. And so it's not a we got it right or we got it wrong. It's a matter of how can we improve our competence. And that's true in every form of communication, including intercultural communication. So in this video, we're going to take a look at what is intercultural competence? Uh, how does that impact you know communication and why would that be an important aspect? of intercultural uh, communication. So we're going to take a look at the intercultural competence, right? So first of all, let's take a step back and, and, and look at what is communication competence? What do we mean by that? Communication competence very simply means engaging in communication with others that is both effective and appropriate within a given context. And that sounds pretty simple and straightforward, right? Effective and appropriate. We can manage that. But then you throw in that context thing and, and that just throws everything into chaos a lot of times, right? Because what is effective and appropriate in one context may not be at all in another context or maybe a better way to do it or a different way to do it and or a way that somebody else prefers to do it. And so you have all these different changes happening and things. So really what we're doing is just trying to find the best that we can do and in a way that is effective and appropriate in a given context. How can we do that in communication? And intercultural competence is not uh, all that different, really. Uh, we're looking f at engaging with people from differing cultures in a manner that is both effective and appropriate within a given context. So really, then we're narrowing it down to, OK, how, how do we do this then within the cultural element, within the cultural context, not just every context under the sun, but the cultural one specifically. So intercultural competence, we just mean how do we do this effectively and appropriately? How do we engage with people uh, in, from different cultures in a way that is effective and appropriate? And we're going to take a look at a very specific model for intercultural competence. It's, it's one that's been used. Uh, it was developed in um, 2006 by uh, and, and presented by a woman named Darla Deerdorf, who is the executive director of the Association of International Education Administrators at uh, present. She's also a UNESCO chair of intercultural competences at Stellenbosch University in South Africa and a research fellow at Duke University. So uh, Darla came up with this wonderful um, framework for how we can uh, you know, understand intercultural competence and how we can look at that. So we're going to be using that. This was, again, something she presented in a paper in 2006 and uh, has kind of become the go to model in the field for just kind of examining um, and understanding the framework of intercultural competence. So um, Darla originally presented this in kind of a pyramid format. So uh, that's what I'm going to be using here. So this is her model uh, and framework for intercultural competence. It starts with at the very bottom here, just the requisite attitudes. OK, so uh, you know, as my uh, grandpa used to say, you need an attitude adjustment. Right. And this is what he meant by that. But, you know, you got to have the right attitude for intercultural competence to develop intercultural competence. You have to have the right mindset, the right attitude. And what we mean by that more specifically is you got to have that, an attitude of respect, of openness and of curiosity and discovery. These are all critical elements um, to intercultural competence. You have to be able to respect now. Understand that respect does not mean that you have to agree with everything from a different culture or, you know, want to embrace it or want to do things that way necessarily. But you have to respect that different cultures are going to do things differently sometimes and and respect them for doing their own thing and and respect where it came from, the tradition behind that and things. You have to have an openness to discovering these things 
and being willing to um, to to go out there and do this, you know, to to you know engage. A lot of times, there's some unknowns that are part of us. We have to be open to different things. We can't just be locked in our own box. Again, that doesn't mean we have to embrace or or you know take on all these attributes, but we have to be open to the the possibilities um, that other there are other ways of doing things in the world, right? And then we really have to have this idea of this element of curiosity and discovery, this desire to know what's out there. To, you know, not even to change the way we do things, but to know how do other people do this and why? And, and you know, what's the significance behind that? And why is it special? And because it can be all of those things and it doesn't have to diminish what we do. But so we have to have all these the right attitude to enter into this. So the requisite attitudes are, as you can see, the, the base of that pyramid, the very foundational things that we need. You have to have the right attitude going into this if you're going to improve your intercultural competency. Next, we need knowledge and comprehension. Right? So we, we talk about things like uh, this idea of cultural self-awareness. We have to know who we are and how that may be different than others. We have to have an understanding of culture itself. What is culture? What is not culture? Uh, and we're going to have a whole discussion on that right? Uh, coming up here. What What is the definition of culture? What do we mean by culture? What is excluded from culture? What is not What is not considered culture? So we have to really understand the idea of culture. Then we have to understand culture-specific info, right? Information that is specific to that that culture. And we have to have a sociolinguistic awareness. Just kind of be aware of of the the linguistics and the and just kind of the you know the the, the socio setting there, the socioeconomic setting, the socio linguistic, and, and just an awareness of, of kind of what's happening. There's knowledge and comprehension of culture as a whole, but also culture specifically for whatever culture it is we are studying. Okay, along with this, um, it's not just knowledge and comprehension. You can see that's at the same level of pyramid, and you know side by side with something else, and that something else is skills. These are, all, you know, really exchanging at all times and interchanging their knowledge and our skills, knowledge and comprehension and skills are hand in hand. They are interlocked. They are interwoven here. We can't have one without the other. Okay. So we've got to have, in order to develop our skills, we've got to have that knowledge and comprehension and they ought to exist simultaneously. So by skills, we mean the skill, first of all, to listen, observe, and interpret. So just to be able to see things and to, to actually listen and truly listen and to observe and, and to be willing to uh, then try and make some interpretation from that. And then beyond that, to analyze, evaluate and relate. How does this connect to me? What does this mean? What is the significance here? And how can I how can I better understand this and maybe um, you know, incorporate some of this if I wish to? So those are the skills that we're going to be working on. right? So knowledge and comprehension and skills work so closely together. That's why they're on the same level of the pyramid there. So, so once we have the right attitude, we can go about learning about culture and about a specific culture then and, and gathering information there and then developing the skills by listening and observing and interpreting. And then eventually analyzing, evaluating and relating to that. Um, we can, we can engage in both knowledge and comprehension and skill building. Then. Once we've done that, then we can move on to thinking about the desired internal outcome and trying to try to adapt and, and develop the desired internal outcome because a lot of cultural competence happens just within us. It happens right within us, right? So we've got to have, first of all, this difference, uh, this shift in frame of reference and just how we see the world and how we uh, perceive the world in general uh, and get away from this idea of right and wrong and good and bad as it relates to culture and get, just get into this idea of different and understanding that there are different ways to perceive things and approach things and do things. So we've got to have that shift in our own frame of reference and an appreciation for the frame of reference of other people. Also internally, we have to get much more comfortable with adaptability, be willing to adapt. Um, when we go to a different culture, um, you know, let's just say culture doesn't just exist in other countries, but let's just, you know, say we go to a different culture across the world. We go to a different country across the world. If you're from the United States and you go visit, you go visit China or you go visit India or you go visit, you know, somewhere in Africa or something like that. Kind of our, our natural inclination at times is to say, well, you know, obviously we're the superior culture in the United States, so I don't really need to adjust. But the truth is we do. If we're going to be in somebody else's car, you go to somebody else's house and they're a shoes off house and you're a shoes on house, you don't just keep your shoes on, right? I mean, you got to, you got to adapt to the rules of that culture, whether it's somebody else's house or whether it's a country across all the way across the world. Right? 
So we have to have that willingness to adapt. That's an internal thing. We have to be more comfortable with adaptability. We have to develop this flexibility, right? This willingness to, to do things differently. We can't be so set in our ways that we don't have a willingness to change. We have to have this ethno-relative view and say, okay, that's not the way we do things in where I'm from, but this is the way they do things here. This is accepted practice here. And so we need to be able to understand that, again, it's not a matter of good or bad or right or wrong, that everything is, is relative when it comes to culture in a sense. Now, again, does that mean if this is a culture where they you know, say, well, murder is the regular here, we sacrifice people. We go, yeah, maybe you can draw a line there somewhere. But, but in general, you know, if you're going to be somewhere and, and get to know that culture, you really have to, to view things in a way that, that says, okay, it's not the way I would normally do things, but it doesn't make it bad or evil or whatever or wrong. Okay, so we have to, to view things in a more relative way. We have to develop a great deal of empathy. That's another internal skill that we have to, to develop, and empathy, the, um, and the ability to see things through someone else's eyes and understand it from their perspective. Again, doesn't mean we have to completely 100% adopt it as true or correct or whatever, but we have to be able to at least see things from their perspective at a base level. That's empathy. So once we've achieved that desired internal outcome and we feel like we have those skills within us, then we can hopefully start to develop the desired external outcome, which is very simply the effect of appropriate, uh, effective and appropriate behavior for achieving one's goals, including communication behaviors, right? So effective and appropriate communication behaviors would be a part of that as well uh, for achieving our goal, whether that goal is to just get to know that culture, whether that, whether our goal is to, um, uh, to do business in that culture, even if our goal, even if our desire is to, you know, dominate and take over that culture, not, that should not be our goal, but, but even if it is your best bet is to, first of all, internalize and adopt that culture uh, so that you can become a part of it so that you can then change it. That's going to make it easier. So again, I'm not trying to convince somebody to engage in world domination, but but that would be the way to do it. Um, so this desired external outcome, being able to, to behave in a way that is culturally competent, right? And and so engaging in communication behaviors and other behaviors that are effective and appropriate for that context, so that we can then achieve our goals. Those are the desired external outcomes. So we move then through these different areas of the pyramid until we get to the peak there for that effective and appropriate behavior. Starting with our attitudes, then moving through the combination of knowledge and comprehension and skills into desired internal outcome and desired external outcome. And, and Deardorff also in her paper, in her presentation, in her paper, uh, went through that process and said, okay, here's the, here, here are the different skills and, and what it looks like is a process attitudes. And she said, yeah, your starting point is absolutely the attitudes. We've got to start at the attitudes. You've got to start at that foundation of attitudes. And then from there, you can go through the other steps and notice, first of all, that it's a, it's a continuing cycle. Uh, and that the, the first couple things here are really individual attitudes and then knowledge and comprehension and skills are individual pursuits. These are things we pursue as individuals, whereas the desired internal outcomes and desired external outcomes then have to do with interaction and interacting with that culture and then, you know, learning to uh, internalize those things and behave in a more way that is, and uh, behave in a way that is culturally appropriate and effective. But then it, then it starts over. I mean, we're continually um, adding and changing, uh, and learning new attitudes and changing our attitudes and, and developing new skills and things. So um, anyway, it's just a continual process, just like anything else in communication. There's never an endpoint. Again, this is why it's not just a, an equation that might have a solution. Eventually, with an equation, you're, you're theoretically going to have a solution, but this is going to be a continual process. Just like everything else in communication, we're constantly having to change and adjust and adapt and add to our skills. And, and even as we master certain things, we can move on then and try and find new things to master. Okay, so there's never really an endpoint to this. But this is what that... that that uh, framework looks like as a process, then, as an orientation process. Okay. And again, uh, just as a reminder, we always want to put progress over perfection in these things. We're, we're never going to reach the end point. That's, that's the whole point. There's never really an end point. Um, again, even as we master certain things, we move on to others. So it's, it's always a matter of progress over perfection. We're never really going to find that perfect solution to being a communicator, being, you know, having intercultural competence or whatever it is. So the best we can do is put progress over perfection and continually strive to improve 
and to add to our intercultural competence. If you have any questions about intercultural competence and how we can develop these skills and about the framework that I shared with you today, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you there. But in the meantime, I hope this will help you understand what that framework looks like and how we can go about then improving our intercultural competence and what that process looks like. And most importantly, that this is a, an ongoing process, right? That, that we're constantly trying to make progress and never really satisfied with the idea that we have achieved perfection because there's always more we can do to improve our intercultural competence.